from Mark chapter 11. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and, it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it. And he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Thank you. You guys can go now with Mr. Marco. Make sure I'm, I'm on, right? Okay. So we have here the story of Jesus entering in to Jerusalem with the twelve and the laying of the palm branches before him, which also comes from the, the beginning when the temple was first, um, when they first built the temple and King Solomon was there. They laid palm branches out for him to walk on. And that's where the part of the story comes from. But there's some, something that we see here in the beginning of this story is that they're, they're having some preparation. There's been preparation been going on since the foundation of the world, that there's this cult that's there that's waiting for Jesus. And Jesus knows that this cult is going to be there. And it's also written about in, in Scripture in the Old Testament. It's fulfilling his prophecy. And Jesus tells him to go and get this colt. And it happens to be that all of these things, that this, the laying of the palms, the colt, and Jesus' time, the people that they're talking to, are all happening at a point and time in history that's specific to that time. This is the time that God established that this would happen. Right at that time, there was nobody else that was going to be other than Jesus. This was the time and the place in Jerusalem, at the temple. They're questioning, they're seeing who is coming. You know, they, we say elsewhere, they're like, who is this? And they all get excited and they go to see who it is that they're going to you know, Jesus is coming, let's go and see, and it's a celebration, and everybody's bringing the palm branches and celebrating as Jesus enters into Jerusalem and goes to the temple. There's this celebration, but they're starting to see him as the Messiah coming in, even though he's riding on his donkey, because it's this is cult, because it's fulfilling these prophecies. But as they get there, Jesus arrives, he gets off the colt or the donkey, goes into the temple, looks around, and that's it. It says that's the end of the day. So they left for the day. So there's this pause, this waiting period that Jesus is now 
established. It wasn't jumping right in and getting things done. It was like, we're here. The day is late. The time is late. We're going to wait. And they wait there. If we jump over into the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. We read the story, the story from the Gospel of John, and it says, The next day, the large crowd that had come to feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. There's this anticipation that something's coming. So Israel, for generations now, has been waiting for the Messiah. Waiting for the Messiah to come. There's been many, many false messiahs over the 400 years of darkness since the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New, where there was nothing going on. We had all kinds of these, these warrior leaders that were coming in, and they were going to take over and drive the Romans out of Israel, and Israel would have their kingdom, and God would come and bless them and be with them, and they would have their land back at this time. And each one of these that came along proved to be false, proved to be false. What the people wanted to see kept being pushed aside, proved to be false. And then we have Jesus comes and is riding into Jerusalem on this young colt, with this donkey, very unwarrior like as he goes in to the temple. We see the people crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna. And this means, it's, it's save us we pray, is what they're saying. This is like welcoming a savior. Save us we pray, Hosanna. Save us. And this was a phrase that was used at the, one, some of the feasts that were done from the Old Testament times that people had always said these words. But when Jesus was riding in on the donkey, they were singing out, Hosanna. But as we look at this story, we see how the people had gone back from, from generations ago and the stories from the Old Testament, it's about Old Testament, about what was going to be happening. And now the people are starting to see these things. The Spirit of God is reaching out, touching people's hearts to see that this is the Messiah coming. But still there's so much they don't understand. You know? Today we can look at the Bible, we look through the Old Testament, we look through the New Testament, we read the stories over and over and over again, and we, under, we come to understand them, we hear sermons about them, read books about them, and know what is happening in each part of the story. But as the disciples were with Jesus, they were experiencing this situation for the first time. This was the, they were seeing it firsthand, witnessing Jesus ride in to Jerusalem. This is the man that they had been with for several years now. Several years going around the country of Jerusalem, being a blessing, going outside and talking to people. And now this is all changing. And we see there in this verse 16 where it tells us that they remembered they started remembering the things that had been written and seeing all these Old Testament prophecies that were, that were coming to pass. They were seeing them with their own eyes, seeing that Jesus was the promised Messiah that was coming. This is the excitement building within them now, now that it's passed and they're reflecting back, going, 
what we think we saw, now we're tying all these pieces together and seeing who this really was that came in to Jerusalem at this time. Jesus himself quotes from the Psalms that we're going to be going into today. During, during, his, time, during his ministry, he quoted from this. In uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 8, Jesus says, he goes, have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus is quoting from the Psalm 118 here. And Jesus quotes a lot from the Psalms, speaking of the Psalms, and he puts himself in, in that place. And, the old, and in the New Testament, when they're interpreting the New Testament and seeing what was happening in the Old, they're saying, that right there, that's the prophecy, that's Jesus coming, telling us that Jesus is the Messiah that was to come. So now we'll go ahead and dive into our Psalm 118. And we're going to be doing verses um, 19 through 29. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So in the first few verses there, 19 through 21, we see what is happening here is, some say it's, it's David. It's really hard to tell because it doesn't tell us who exactly it is. But he's going to the temple. And he's asking the question, open, the gate, open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. And the guard said, the gate, this is the gate of the Lord, and the righteous shall enter through it. And then in 21, and I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The gate is only being open to the righteous. And the one making the request in turn gives thanks for being made righteous. He gives thanks to God for making him righteous. He knows that he does not have the power to make himself righteous. No matter how hard he tries, he cannot do it. He depends on on God for that, for that righteousness. So God is the Savior for the psalmist, for the one asking the question, Lord, let me enter in here. And as we see this, him asking this question, we see that we have to ask questions also that when we come to Jesus and ask him to come into our hearts, Lord, save me, save me, and we turn to repent, we repent, turn to Jesus, and ask for him to let us in. If we look in Revelation 
chapter 21, um, verse 27. We read, But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does not who is detestable or false, only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So, pretty harsh words. Nothing unclean will ever enter, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. Everyone falls short. We have... We don't have the ability. We have Adam and Eve's sin that we're dealing with. We're born into sin. We keep committing sins. We are entirely dependent on God for our salvation. And we see where the psalmist is giving thanks for this salvation and says, I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for for giving me this that you've answered me and become my salvation. We see throughout the Psalms, the Psalms are, are so interesting because the psalmist, in most cases, comes to God with a complaint. God, why? Why is this happening to me? What's, what's you know, why am I being invaded? Why have I done this? Where are you at? Why are you not helping me? And in those same psalms where the psalmist is saying, you know, hearing the complaint of each person and then answers them, gives them an answer. It may not be the answer we want to hear, but God will always give an answer. And in the psalmist's case, the psalmist always praises God and glorifies God for the answer that's received, no matter what that answer is. We remember last last week, Pastor Matt was preaching on, on, talking about Jeremiah and how Jeremiah was telling everybody that they were going to be going into captivity and Jeremiah was still praising God because of this. He keeps praising God because he knows that he'll be saved. There's going to be things that happen in our lives that we will face good times. We'll have times of good, times of plenty. Things will be great, but there'll be times where we're sick. We have pain in our heart from loss, challenges that we don't, maybe we we don't have a job. Maybe we're injured. Maybe we can't work. Maybe we're sick. We don't have these abilities. Something has happened that's made our life difficult. And it could be frustrating because we'll be just like those in the Bible that cry out, why, God, why is this happening to me? Why has this happened to me? But God does things or allows things and makes use of things that we do to better us, to make ourselves, to make us better, to be more like Him, to walk in His light. We are our own worst enemy. We have choices to make. And as we do things, we make bad choices sometimes. And we might recognize those bad choices later on, remember them and what we did wrong at that time and where it led us up to. We can't undo those things, but we can remember, remember what happened and how we can also remember and look back and see how God was changing our life during that time. What is God doing in my life as I'm 
going through this trial. We see Jesus entering in the palm branches. Everybody's excited. Okay, this is the this is the big week. The Messiah is in Jerusalem. Everybody's excited. Yay, this is fantastic. Everything's going to be great. Israel's going to be back in power. The Romans are going to go away. This is good. And five days later, Jesus is on the cross. And it's like this. Stunned silence. Everybody was like, what happened? What happened to the Messiah? And then they started remembering. When Jesus was resurrected three days later, they start remembering things from the past. What was told to them before? These are the things that we have available to us also that we can go back and look at the scriptures and remember what happened to others throughout the history of the Bible. We can go back into our own lives, the lives of those that we know, and see things and remember how to deal with situations and be that help. In verses 22 through 26, continue on, it says, The stone the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus is a cornerstone. The cornerstone is this rock that ends up in the corner of the building. Okay? And without this cornerstone being set straight, one wall has to go straight this way and one wall has to go straight that way and ultimately you get the building to be square or rectangle. The corners end up being square. And the cornerstone, so Jesus, God gave Israel, the tribe of Jacob, Abraham, then Isaac, and then Jacob, and then all the children gave them the law. And this is what they were following, the instructions. It was ultimately led up to Jesus. They said, this is like the one wall. Then we have the second wall, which is the Gentiles. So Jesus is the one that's the cornerstone, the foundation upon whom both sides help to form the building, this one building that becomes his church. Those who obey God, those who turn to God and obey God, they are the ones, they are the chosen ones. We have to turn to God to ask him, Lord, save me. He saves us, pays the price for our sins, and then in return, we are to follow him in a bay. In Acts chapter 4, verse 11. This is uh, Peter's talking. And it says, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. He's talking to the Pharisees. The builders, the builders being, they were the ones, they were the ones that were given the law. They built the king, they were building the kingdom of Israel, God's kingdom. You know, we can't just say, just ignore everything about Israel. Israel, God was leading Israel for thousands of years before the church ever came along. God has not forgotten Israel. God has not forgotten anybody. He is for all of us. It says, rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other name for Jew and Gentile. All are sinners, both Jew and Gentile. We all fall short. We all sin and cannot save ourselves. In Romans chapter 3, we read, As it is written, this is the Apostle Paul writing, 
says, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. None. Nobody is righteous without Jesus. No matter how good you think you are, no matter how nice you are, how many good things you do in this life, you still sin. You still sin. And Paul is telling us here that we're all sinners. We've all fallen short. We all need Jesus. We all need to come to Jesus for that forgiveness. We can think we're great even after we become Christians. We can think we're better than everybody else. But we're not. We're still struggling. We're still struggling. We talk about the triumphal entry. There's the church, something called the church triumphant. The church has overcome. Jesus has overcome the world. He is the king. He is God. He is over everything and will always be over everything. But there's also something called the church militant. And the church militant, who we are, we still face all these struggles. All these struggles that are out there, we still face heat, cold, wars, famines, Everything is still confronting us. And we fight against this by turning to God because God fights for us. Even when we're going through these trials, he is there with us, helping us out. As I was praying about this, contemplating this this morning, I was thinking of the Apostle Paul and how the Apostle Paul tells us I've been beaten with rods, I've been whipped, been left for dead multiple times, I've been shipwrecked, but all for the glory of God. It has nothing to do with me. It's all for the glory of God. He's gone through these things. And if ever we think that walking with Jesus is going to be a walk in the park and everything is going to be always great, Go back and look at the Apostle Paul. Things are going to be tough, but things are always going to be right with God because if we keep turning to God, Lord, save me. Keep helping me. Keep helping me. Get me through this challenge that I'm in. No matter what it is, even though I'm beaten up or I'm poor or whatever it is, God will still be with me. Now, I have a section here on our next slide that's from our the Wesleyan discipline. This is the things that we believe, and I know Pastor Matt loves it when I've used the discipline. I'm like the only one he knows that uses the discipline in sermons. But I think it has value. It says, we believe that justification, this is Jesus saying, come in and saying, you're not, we're not guilty of sin. That justification is the judicial act of God whereby a person is accounted righteous granted a full pardon for sin, of all sin, delivered from guilt, completely released from the penalty of sins, committed by the merit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, by faith alone and not on the basis of works. In other words, Jesus paid the price. He's our propitiation. And when I looked up the uh, Hosanna in John, the definition in one of the uh, lexicons was to propitiate, which is probably not real helpful. <laughs> it's to be a savior. They're saying Jesus is our savior. He's here. He's here to save us. He's here to pay the price for our sins. He's here to pay for us, to pave the way for us. And it goes on to say also in the discipline that we will go on to sin, but there's always a way to have that forgiveness that Jesus offers, that grace that he offers, and that is to repent 
of whatever it is that we're doing and turn back to him. Turn back to him with our whole heart. Then verse 27 through 29. Says, the Lord is God. He has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. So we see him start off there in that section. The Lord is good. He has has made his light to shine upon us. God is guiding us. He has sent his spirit to be with us, to be, to know what it is that God wants us to do. And He wants us to walk in his light. He's chosen us. It says in 1 Peter, uh, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That, that you may proclaim his excellencies. God sent us free, not so that we can just have a good day. God sent us free so that we can play, proclaim him as God above all. To tell the world that he is God that Jesus is God, that he is the Messiah that came, that died, was resurrected, resurrected, and is coming back, who sent his spirit to be with us. It tells us here how he binds the festal sacrifice. It's like you have this image of the horns, of the, here's, a, here's the altar, and they have these horns that come out on either, like, curved pieces or big giant hooks on the altar. They say he's going to take the sacrifice up to the altar and bind it to those horns. This image of the sacrifice being bound is it's not going anywhere. Jesus is our sacrifice. He is the God's perfect sacrifice. He is not going anywhere. He is that way. He is not leaving us. He will never leave us. We can leave him but he will never leave us. We can sit there and try and cover our ears and yeah, 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 I don't want to hear you, but he's going to keep working on our heart, keep working on our heart all the time to keep driving us back to him, to change who we are, to make us who he wants us to be. He wants us to be that people who worship him, who are thankful for the gifts that he has given to us. <clears throat> In uh, Ephesians, chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. For through him we have access to the one spirit, uh, to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together 
grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place by the Spirit. God is bringing us together for a purpose. It's no longer about me. It's about him and his body. We all have a role to play in this body. God gives us gifts. He gives us gifts that we can use to edify others in this body, to help others praise God and to serve him. He is bringing us together. He is bringing us all together, all the Christians around the world. We're one body. And one day we'll all be together as one body. And right now, Jesus is showing us how to do that. How to take away our personal animosities. Nowhere in the Gospels do we see Jesus saying, nah, you're not quite up to my expectations. You think of the woman at the well when Jesus is talking to her. And she's like, why are you talking to me? I'm not a Jew. You know, you're not supposed to be talking to me and you're talking to a woman. What is the matter with you? And yet Jesus was speaking to her. Speaking to her because he knew that she was the entry point into this community to share who he was and to get others to understand who he was. Through all of this, That last line in the psalm where it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. His steadfast love is that called that has said, you see it pronounced H E S E or C H S E D E S E. It's has said. It's a Hebrew word. It means it's God, it's unmerited favor. God says, I chose you because I chose you. God chose us because he chose us. We weren't like raising our hands, oh, pick me, pick me. No. God says, I want you and you and you and you and you and you and you. I want all of you. Come to me. He chose us. We wouldn't even know who God is unless he told us by his spirit who he is. We don't have the capacity to make ourselves righteous, to pay for our sins. We depend on God, and God is faithful. We see him here in the Psalms. We see him in the New Testament telling us what is going to happen? We can do the same thing that the disciples did when Jesus was there coming in to the town after he was taken up, and they started remembering, reflecting back, going, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's in the Psalms. We've been singing about this for years. This is who he is. And we can see what he did and what he promises and how he keeps his promises. In the Old Testament, God said, The Messiah, I will come, and I will turn your hearts to me. And Jesus comes, the Spirit comes, and turns our hearts to him, to where we can serve him. And he also says, I'm coming back. I'm with you now, and I'm coming back. We think, man, been a long time. It's been a long time, 2,000 years. I don't know how many generations that is, but that's a long time. But yet when we go back looking at 
the Gospel of Mark. The big day arrived, Jesus gets to the temple, looks around, and makes him wait. Makes him wait. God teaches us in waiting. He makes us wait. He puts us in situations that make us go, okay, calm down. Let's see what we need to do. What's God going to do here? What does God want me to do in this? Rather than just going out and doing whatever. He wants us to help. He wants us to be with us. So I have four quick points. A little bit to go with them afterwards. And the first is... We have to remember to believe in Jesus for salvation. Never forget this. Believe in Jesus for salvation. It's not just believing in Jesus one time. It's believing in Jesus and keep believing. Keep believing even when all the world is falling apart and it seems like God has completely abandoned you, that keep believing that he is there for you. In Romans chapter 10, Verses 5 through 13, it says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteous based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Just believing it. That's all you got to do. Just believe that he will do it. And in believing In believing in him, he does something for us. He gives us the capacity to start changing, to repent, to turn to him, to keep his commandments. In John 14, which is our next, to keep his commandments, 1415, it says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments if you love me. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Remember, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Love, a desire, followed by an action. A desire with nothing is not love. A desire followed by action is the love. We say, I love Jesus means I want I want to be with Jesus and I want to be obedient to Jesus. Keep his commandments. The third one. Jesus makes it possible for us to obediently serve him. He's the one that's making it possible to be able to serve him. In Hebrews, it says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place. Remember back in the, the Psalm 118 where the psalmist was saying, Lord, let me in. Let me, through the, you know, let me through the gates to the temple or the tabernacle or whatever it was when this psalm was written. Let me in. It is, here he's saying, gives us the, Jesus gives us the confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. 
And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Jesus is preparing us. He's telling us to be encouraging. These things are hard to do. They're hard for us to do because our natural self thinks this way. What about me? Me. God wants to change our thinking to think out to God and others. Out, not in, out. Throughout the, ten, throughout the Bible, we see God calls somebody to do something. Invariably, he says, go. Go do this. Out. What's outpouring his spirit, to, his, uh, his light, his spirit to go out from us. To remember that God is preparing us. He is the one doing the preparing. And finally, from Palm Sunday, the, the excitement of everything that's going on on Palm Sunday, that Jesus, the Savior, is coming to Jerusalem. He's in the temple. But for us, it's also to remember that Jesus is coming back. He is coming back. And in Revelation, chapter 22, verses 20 and 21, it says, He who testifies to these things surely says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, and the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. He's coming back. He wants us to be prepared. We don't know the hour, the time. It could be two seconds from now. Nope. It could be five seconds from now. It could keep going. It's always being prepared. When is Jesus going to come back? says to us to be ready. So when we're angry of heart, when we're frustrated, when we're feeling down or bad about ourselves, Jesus is coming back. And we don't know when. So find joy in that. Find joy in knowing that he is coming back. That he is with us now. That he's with us now, here to support, to bless us. As we go through this Holy Week, let us turn to Jesus, to reflect on him, to reflect on the Old Testament prophecies that were said of him. Let us be prepared for his coming. Let us be thankful that he has revealed himself to us, that he has given himself completely to us. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to, to share your word, Lord, to share this day that you have made for us, Lord. We thank you for the blessings that you give to us. Lord, the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, the friends we have, the family we have, Lord, we thank you for all of this. Lord, we thank you for your church, for all your, all your children around the world, Lord. We pray for all of them, that all may come to know you with a full heart, Lord, to be uplifted, to turn to you with complete and utter devotion. Lord, that our thinking turns away from ourselves and turns to you, turns to loving you and lo loving one another, Lord, that you love each of us. Lord, we thank you for all of this. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>